In the last session, we calculated, uh, based on a scenario here, the break-even point in number of units for uh, the company. Um, just to remind ourselves the calculation, we knew that the total fixed costs of the company was $23,500, and we divided this by the dollar contribution per unit at the company, which was $46, and that gave us a result of 511 units corresponding to the break-even level. Today we just want to take this forward uh, one step to get familiar with the idea of a contribution per sale, the CS ratio. The contribution, or amount of contribution generated for every dollar of sale that we achieve. That is the CS ratio. In the previous example, the CS ratio would be calculated as the contribution, which we said was equal to selling price 120 minus variable costs of 74, which gives us 46. So for every dollar of sale. If we sell one unit for $120, we get $46 uh, dollars of contribution. So if we divide that and come up with um, zero, 46 divided by 120 is 0 0.38. And this is 38 cents for every dollar of sale. This is the CS ratio. Now, the reason why this is useful to us is that the break-even level of sales can be calculated. In other words, the revenue that corresponds to the break-even level. The formula is take our fixed costs of 23,500 and to divide it by the CS ratio of 0 0.38 Three, which will give us a break-even point expressed in sales of $61,310. Now let's uh, test this result for common sense. We said that the break-even level expressed in units was 511 units. If we multiply these 511 units by the selling price of $120 per unit, we will get 61320 So apart from a small rounding difference, we have confirmed that the sales revenue in dollars does indeed con correspond to the break-even point of 511 units. Now let's turn our attention to some other examples of short-term uh, decision-making, one being uh, the notion of limiting factors. When we have a, lim a single limiting factor, in production, then what is what we have to do is try to uh, plan our production around that single uh, limiting factor so that we can maximize the um, our, our our performance. Let's look at the following example. Suppose we had a product, three products X, Y, and Z. Here are the selling prices, labor costs per unit, material costs per unit, and the contribution contributions per Per unit. It would seem, if we compare these products on the face of it, that product Z is the most interesting because it has the higher or the highest uh, contribution per unit. Now, let's look at another angle here. Assume that labor hours available to our production process are limited to 500 hours and the labor costs $2 per hour. Okay. And demand remains unlimited for all the three products. We don't have a constraint imposed by demand, but there is a possible constraint imposed by the number of labor hours that are imposed. Now the question becomes, how shall we allocate these labor hours to our products in order to maximize our, our results? If we were to uh, make the following calculation. Labor cost per unit is shown 
per product and the number of hours per unit required. We can see here the product Z requires 10 hours per unit to produce, whereas X uh, requires only 5 hours uh, per unit. This is labor hours. Therefore, we can see that the contribution expressed on a labor hour basis, in other words, as a function of the scarce factor, uh, X actually does better if we devote the 500 hours to producing um, product X, then we would produce a contribution equal to $3 per hour, or $1,500. Whereas if we had devoted the full 500 hours to product Z, we would have generated only $2 per hour of contribution per hour or a maximum of $1,000. In other words, we can see here now, given this uh, constraint, that X should be favored over Z. By recalculating the contribution, not on a per unit basis, but on the basis of the scarce factor, in this case, labor hours, we come up with a different way of looking at the situation and a different conclusion. Let's have a look at another type of short-term decision-making problem, a make-buy decision. Have a look at this example where an automotive components producer can buy a certain component from outside in other words, an external or outsourced component, $210 per unit. Or we can produce the unit internally. But the company has to calculate how much it will effectively cost it to make that same unit internally and if it's cheaper to keep the production in-house. Now, it notices that equivalent unit can be made in two labor hours using $100 worth of materials. So, assuming the labor is currently full capacity inside the company and therefore producing already another product which generates contribution of $100, and assume that the existing product takes 2.5 hours to produce, labor costs $10 per hour, and the carburetor also absorbs fixed overhead costs at the rate of $20 per hour. What are the relevant costs connected to producing our uh, this um, these car heaters internally well the comparison of course is we pay two hundred and ten dollars to an outside producer and we get the heater if we do it inside we pay one hundred dollars for the materials that's a relevant cost and we also lose eighty dollars of contribution on the carburetors that we cannot produce during the time that we produce a car heater. Now this 80 is arrived at by looking at the contribution of $100 that corresponds to 2.5 hours of work. However, to produce our car heater, we need two hours of labor that we have to divert from the carburetors. In other words, this is 80% of the time spent to produce a carburetor. Therefore, proportionately speaking, the contribution lost will be 80% of $100 or $80. Of course, the contribution also includes the labor costs so we need to add back labor because we incur these labor costs uh, one way or the other so for two hours of work we have to add back twenty dollars worth of labor and therefore it seems to be based on relevant costs cheaper to produce internally the car heater. We do better than if we were to pay $210
to an outside party. This analysis has been based on a careful calculation of what our current situation is at the company and what costs would change as a result of switching over from producing a carburetor to producing a, um, a car heater. So what we've discussed here is the notion of relevant costs, that the decisions that we uh, base, um, the facts we base our decisions on have to be relevant costs. And typically what, co what relevant uh, cost is, is a cash cost, which lies in the future and changes as a result of the decision that we take. Here's another example for the candidate to read. It's future directed. Some costs are, of course, not relevant. Committed costs, if they cannot be avoided, are also not relevant. So, in summary, we can say the relevant costs involve cash. They are incremental. In other words, we have to determine what the difference is in the cash impact when we make choices between alternatives, and they relate to the future. Another type of short-term decision is to price uh, contracts for or projects. And here there is a, uh, an example which shows the kinds of factors that one needs to take into account in order to uh, uh, determine what the cost of a project is. Um, we leave it to the candidate to uh, make a determination based on the scenario here with regard to labor, and materials, research and development, equipment, and so on, to determine what the relevant costs um, will be in connection with that con uh, project. That's a typical example of, of the type of um, relevant costing uh, that needs to be applied. Also, um, if we were to another simple example of the same concept with regard to opportunity costs would be if a company decides to change the use of an existing site to another um, function and build a storage facility instead of a parking lot, if there were fees being generated on the existing facility that would now be lost, that revenue which is lost would become an opportunity cost and has to be factored into a um, decision in terms of costing the new project. It is a relevant cost that meets the criteria that we defined earlier. Uh, shutdown decisions uh, is, is another example of making a determination whether or not a plant, um, meaning a factory, should close or not. In this case, we have a company which is producing 40 uh, million in revenues and has 44 million in costs, and therefore it looks like it's making a loss, in fact, of $4 million. However, 25% of the costs are fixed costs allocated by head office, which means that effectively if the plant were to close, only $33 million of the costs would disappear, but $40 million of revenues would be lost. In other words, the company would be worse off by closing down the plant because 11 million, 25% of the fixed costs, 11 million are, don't go away. Those are costs that exist at head office and have been allocated to the factory. They are, they are not relevant because they continue to exist one way or the other. So this is another example of the kind of fallacies that are practiced by managements that are not used to the concept of relevant costing.